not here. Um, so we're going to be looking at gender roles and relationships in the Rococo. So let's just do a little bit of review. Um, so here is the piece that we talked about yesterday by Fragonard um, called The Swing. And what I'd like you to do is to list as many things as you can see that are Roco, Rococo, right? So list as many things as you can. Go ahead and feel free to put that in the chat. So list as many things as you can possibly see about this painting that makes it Rococo. Feel free to look back at your note takers if you have questions. Uh, I don't think we can see it. Thank you. There you go. You got it now. I appreciate you coming on audio. Can't tell you how many times people do not tell me that. So how is it Rococo? Come up with at least, I'd like to have at least three, but there is more than three. So put it in the chat, please. So we got a few people to chat for everyone. So if you look in the chat, right, we can see pastel colors. We see superficial subject matter. We have figures in motion. We've got dramatic lighting. We've got feathery brush stroke. We've got playful subject matter. We have the show of space with that atmosphere perspective. Very good. Right. So remember that these works are primarily made for the aristocracy. Right. And so they could be made for the king and queen and their mistresses and this and, um, and so forth, but it also could be for the court. And the moods of these tend to be very playful, alive with energy. Sometimes they're kind of frivolous or like superficial subject matter. So remember Madame Pompadour putting on her blush, that sort of thing. Um, there's themes of love, classical scenes of pooties and clouds and cupids. Um, the colors tend to be light and graceful and delicate. Um, decorative imagery, um, sometimes with feathery brushstroke, right? So um, this is actually an artist from the Baroque. We talked about um, looking at some Danish, or excuse me, some um, Dutch painters. Remember when we looked at the Dutch painters? And here we have, oh, I cannot believe I forgot her name. It's one of those days, I apologize. Um, this is Judith Leister. There we go, Judith Leister. And what I thought, um, it's kind of interesting because it's, you know, the day after International Women's Day, we have women artists uh, today. And so um, it was hard to be a female artist in the Baroque period and, and, and you know, any sort of period, actually. Um, but, you know, in the Baroque period, it was hard to be an artist. And so can anyone tell me how she appears to be a successful artist? I think we talked about this actually already, but how does she appear to be successful? Come on, you can jump in on audio. How does she appear to be successful? Kwana, can I pick on you? Because I know you paint. Would you wear this to paint? Not usually. No, because it's way too nice. Right, it's she's wearing really fancy clothing, and so she's showing herself as being prosperous through her clothing. And, um, this actually, you know, the second part of this question would what, what would be the disadvantage of being a female artist? Um, you only were allowed to do certain subject matter, right? So, in Holland, right? When we look at the Dutch painters, they typically did genre paintings, portraits, still lifes, that sort of thing. Anything that was like, you know, made for the church or anything that would made for, be made for the aristocracy, anything that would be like elevated subject matter would, was totally the man's domain. And so um, female painters typically painted subject matters um, like 
this self-portrait of herself, but you can see she shows herself painting what she's known for, which is these portraits and these genre paintings of uh, musicians, right? She was a famous painter of musicians. And one of the reasons for this is that this is the time of the start of art academies. So we start to have organizations of artists meeting together and when I think of academies, I think about schooling. A lot of people stayed in these academies throughout their life. It wasn't like you would just graduate and then you were out. It was almost like a fraternity of artists. And one of the things you'll notice by looking around is that they were all male. So most of these academies um, only allowed in men, right? And of course, white men, right? And you can see based on what's going on in this painting of these academies that they would often um, draw from or paint from the figure. And so we here we have a nude model that's male. And then you can see that there are portrait busts and recreations of ancient um, sculptures. And so they would tend to draw from plaster cast of fa famous artworks from the past. And so this was kind of stereotypical. So they, they had kind of a classical sort of tendency to them. Another artist who made a mark for herself was a Rococo painter, and her name was Elizabeth Louis Viget Le Brun. And here is a self portrait of herself. So we had a self portrait of Leicester. Now we have one of Le Brun, right? And, um, I, you know, kind of said it here, but what's the subject matter, right? The subject matter, the content of this is a self-portrait, right? It's in the name, right? So how does she appear successful? She's not quite wearing the costume that we just saw, but it's maybe some similar. So how does she appear successful? Jeffrey, can you give me one way she appears successful? Uh, I feel like similar to the like last person, she also has like pretty nice clothes on. She does. She has her best of her best clothing on. Um, she has that beautiful red bow on the back of her gown, right? Um, look at her face. Look at her face, right? Is she shying away from looking at the viewer? No, she's very confident in her ability, right? Kind of re reminds me, she's like a Renaissance woman here. So she's looking at the viewer confidently. She's showing a lot of her. This is kind of like a three quarter portrait where you see a majority of her. She's also showing herself at her profession, right? So she's a painter. So she's got her palette. She's got her brushes. She's got her hair wrapped up just like Rembrandt's. Remember all those Rembrandt self-portraits of him with his hair wrapped? Because if you were working on these grandiose paintings and you're not showering or taking a bath every day, you'd want to protect your hair, right? So she's protecting her hair. And then what is she allowed to paint? Like, how is she allowed to be successful? Who is she painting images of? Can you see it on the painting on the far left? Who is she painting? Anyone know? Is it other women? It's another woman. So she was a painter of women. So she was allowed to do portraits of women. That would be okay with the new standards that were coming out of the academy. So she had a series of images of women. So here are some of those women. This is actually another self-portrait of her on the left. Here is a countess on the right, right? Here, this is a countess, right? And so she was the painter of Marie Antoinette. So she was the official court painter of um, Marie Antoinette. And she actually um, made this painting when she was in exile in Rome, because of course um, she would have to leave because of course Marie Antoinette, right? With the revolution that was coming up. So she made this painting of her while she was in exile. Um, we might come back to this, um, but this is a Marie Antoinette painting that she made and it's all based on her being a good mother, right? So if we look here, we see Marie Antoinette 
holding her children. And then sadly, there's also a bassinet that's empty to represent a dead uh, child, one of her children that passed away um, over there. And so she probably really wasn't a good mother, right? She would have had very limited access to her children because she would have had other duties to perform, but it shows her as a good um, mother. And that was real typical for this time period is to have subject matter of women as like heroic and it would be ideals. And so this kind of ideal of being a good mother was common for images of women. So this is an activity that we typically do under normal circumstances, but we're going to skip through here. And so let's look at this and figure out why we consider this to be Rococo. So what are some style characteristics of this one? right? It's a little bit different than the Fragonard. It's not going to have all of the Fragonard characteristics, but what makes this Rococo? You can go ahead and throw it in the chat. That is fine. Waiting for that chat, so throw it in the chat when you know. We've got light colors, feathery brush strokes, relaxed mood. Very good, right? And so we'll go back and look at the whole thing again. And so here we have portraits of, of women, right? She's painting portraits of the aristocracy, even though she is not, she's a court painter. Right, she's an official court painter. And so here we have her painting. And then we have the image of her painting Marie Antoinette, obviously the queen, right? And we have dramatic contrast. So it has that Baroque lighting. Notice it, it's illuminating what's most important, her face, her hand, and the portrait of Marie Antoinette, right? So that spotlight effect is really telling us what's most important right? The mood is very playful and alive. It's almost like she, we, she's in the middle of painting and we walked in and she like smiles at the camera. Of course, there's no camera at the moment, but she's like, oh, you come to my studio. Hi. And she's like, got this little smile. And then of course the colors are light and graceful and delicate. It's not necessarily all those foo-foo pastel wedding cake sort of colors um, like we saw and some of the earlier Rococo painting, but we see that feathery breaststroke that is very evident, especially in the image of Maria Antoinette and the background. It's almost like there's that haze of atmospheric perspective to show the space and to really emphasize her being a working artist. Another um, female artist of this time period is Adelaide Labrille Guard, and she rebelled against the academy. So she actually taught other women how to paint. And so she was a teacher. So here she's showing herself painting and these people behind her are her pupils. And you can see that she's showing that she's educated because what's behind her portrait busts and in like um, plaster sculptures that they would be studying from if they were in a male dominated academy. Right? So she's shown successful because she's got her velvets and satin, her really fancy hat, hat and um, you know she's there uh, painting a large painting. Right, This isn't like a small little dainty painting. This is a very big painting. Um, I would dare say um, Lebrun is working on a big canvas as well. Right, So that shows her status. Okay, so factors that lead away. So we're gonna start looking at neoclassicism. And so there's some factors that we need to know about why art shifts away from the Rococo. It's probably some things that you can guess considering that we just looked at um, Marie Antoinette. One, we have the enlightenment, right? So we have the enlightenment. We have a reaction against the excess and the frills of Rococo. Rococo was very much like a party scene. It was all about um, fancy dresses, fancy costumes, being seen. And, you know, a lot of this is coming from the excess of people like Louis XIV. And that happened for Louis XV and XVI and so on, right? We have the French Revolution taking place with the beheading of Louis 
um, the 16th, and then of course of Marie Antoinette as well. And then we have the rising of neoclassicism. And so we have this Winkleman, right? His name is Joachim Winkleman, and he was a Prussian art historian. And he actually wrote one of the very first art history textbooks. And one of the things that he coined, like a term that became very popular from that book was this idea of noble simplicity and calm grandeur. And so when we think of noble simplicity and calm grandeur, we we hear echoes of classicism from ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. So it will once again see all those characteristics. And I mean, I by now we're getting kind of sick of them, right? We should know them by heart because we've seen classicism in late Gothic. We've seen classicism in Renaissance. We see classicism in Baroque. And then we'll see classicism again in, neo, in neoclassicism, right? Neo being new. We have the academies dictating the style and theories, and they emphasize an artist named Poussin, who we mentioned earlier, we'll see again, right? So the Enlightenment, it was from about 1750 to about 1850, and this is all rooted in scientific advances. So if we're looking to science, we're going to see a scrutiny for realism, right? Because there's that kind of scientific classification, scientific analyzing of, of, of imagery and of objects. And so it's really rooted in that. Um, we have a time of philosophical revolutions taking place as well as those scientific ones. And we're gonna start to see industrialization during this time, right? And a lot of the enlightenment, you know, comes from this idea of going back to reason, right? revering nature, humanity that came from studying the ancients. So studying Greek and Roman Renaissance and so on. Um, there was a belief in optimism of humanity and institutions. Um, we think about this as being about industrial revolution, but even just revolution, right? This concept of the American revolution is gonna take place, the French revolution is gonna take place, is that we think that we can do better, right? We can do better than the establishment, we can do better than the monarchy. And so um, we have those revolutions taking place and the move from aristocratic power to democratic powers and new countries being taken, um, created. So breaking from tradition. And they have a renewed emphasis, excuse me, they have a new um, renewed interest in the classics because this is the time that Pompeii was excavated. So they found that you know, ruined city from Mount Vesuvius. And this is also the time where Lord Elgin stole all those um, pediment sculptures from the Parthenon and brought them to England. And so those pieces that are now in, um, the British Museum were brought during this time to decorate his home, right? So here we can see the artworks that happen after Rococo. And this is where we'll end, right? This is where we'll end today. Um, looking at how the subject matter changes. We're gonna have artworks based on science. Literally, we're gonna see a scientific model being painted, right? We're gonna have sculptures of great thinkers of the day. We're going to have Thomas Jefferson designing his home to look like um, a classical temple as well as Palladio. We're going to have um, historical narratives based on democracy as well as teaching of morality. And so even in France, we have the Rococo style, that feathery style, right? But we have it being used to teach morality. Right, so here's a governess teaching the little boy of the house that he should be studying and not playing and not doing childish things. We have lots of scenes of you know, domestic life, work, bringing dignity to everyday subject matter, everyday work. This is Chardin. And then this is gross. And he was basically saying, okay, all that frivolousness of Rococo, we got to come back and teach morality. So he was all teaching family values. So here we have a father who is just so upset that his 
little girl is going to be married and moving away from the house. So there's like these very dramatic soap opera like paintings being taken place that tell narratives about what it means to be a good family, to mourn the sick, to be devastated that your, um, you know, your father has passed away. Okay, so that's where we'll end today. So we'll be looking at um, neoclassicism tomorrow.